Okay. All right. So what we're going to do uh, is uh, finish up this discussion um, and um, talk about hypercalcemia, hypocalcemia. And this is um, the slide you saw, but now it kind of has changed. And the problem with someone who has hypercalcemia is almost always um, an issue of bone losing state. And I know the calcium absorptive states, yes, but it's really unusual to have a hyperabsorptive hypercalcemia. The, I mentioned the vitamin D yeah, this morning. Yeah, it can contribute, but it's almost always bone loss. If you're going to develop hypercalcemia, calcium is coming from your bones. And it's coming to a degree where you're in negative calcium balance. And that is one of the ways, not the only. It's a necessary but not sufficient reason for becoming. Hello, welcome, welcome. You, you didn't miss too much. What you missed is going to be on the quiz. Uh-oh. Yeah, it's going to be on the quiz. There are no quizzes, don't worry. <laughs> OK, um, so uh, this is the negative calcium balance that uh, can lead to hypercalcemia. Not always. In fact, people with osteoporosis, this is sort of what they are, not quite as dramatic. And we know that osteoporosis is generally not a hypercalcemic state. You know, the serum calcium and the kind of osteoporosis we typically see is associated with a perfectly normal serum calcium. So uh, you can be a negative calcium balance, but not be hypercalcemic. But in this setting that we're talking about, we are seeing hypercalcemia. So there are, um, uh, there are two lists of hypercalcemia. One is this one, which is very short. And I tell um, not our fellows, because we know more than most people, but if you aren't uh, erudite and in the field, um, this is all you have to know 90% of the time. You're dealing with either someone who has primary hyperparathyroidism or you're dealing with a malignancy. Not always, of course, but generally speaking, from a statistical point of view, a hypercalcemic person is going to have uh, either hyperpara or malignancy. But of course, we have a much longer list, and that's for where we come in. When we're asked to do a consult on a patient with hypercalcemia, we typically have to access this longer list of situations that can be associated with hypercalcemia. And you know these um, medications. Um, I changed this list for this presentation. Last year, I did not have the enzyme, the CYP24A1 enzyme deficiency. But now, it's becoming um, in a, not such a rare cause of hypercalcemia. And um, we'll touch on why this has become kind of interesting. And then any of the granulomatous diseases, um, a source of, of vitamin D, um, often 125-dihydroxy vitamin D, because the macrophages on the, in these granulomatous diseases uh, have acquired the capability to convert 25-hydroxy to 125. Um, and we talked about toxicity this morning, which is more typically a situation where the 25-hydroxy vitamin D is elevated. Um, we have lymphoma. We have our friend FHH. We have immobilization hypercalcemia that tends to occur in young, growing kids. Um, they can become rather markedly hypercalcemic. Um, and the very old, um, well, I don't know how very old is, but whatever your definition of very old, add 10 years. You know, I, yeah. I don't know, um, but I know there were some studies where they put, took healthy volunteers and put them on bed rest for like two weeks or something. Did their calcium levels go up after? Uh, did they become hypercalcemic? I don't think so. Um, the best example of true immobilization are the astronauts. And there have been a lot of studies now on the weightlessness. And that is a relative immobilization syndrome. And um, they don't become hypercalcemic. They develop marked 
hypercalcuria, marked hypercalcuria. Um, and uh, one of the limits to space travel is going to be the skeleton um, because the unloading of weightlessness leads to, I mean, really marked hypercalcemia. They are losing percentages of bone mass every week. If they go to Mars and they don't figure out this problem, by the time they come to the Earth's atmosphere, they'll disintegrate their bones. So that's an example of, and they, I don't, I'm pretty sure they don't become hypercalcemic. But the very old, for whatever reason, and the growing skeleton, you can see it. Uh, acute or chronic renal disease can be associated with hypercalcemia. Of course, the chronic renal disease, when it's hypercalcemic, what we use, typically say we've developed the tertiary hyperparathyroidism. So a couple of comments about the major uh, causes. Um, this is a very old study, but it's still true. 90% of patients with hypercalcemia will have one or the other. And depending upon where you are, you're going to see more one or the other. Um, if you're at Sloan Kettering or MD Anderson, um, you're going to see much more malignancy associated hypercalcemia. If you're in an outpatient setting, someone comes in with hypercalcemia, much more likely it's going to be um, primary hyperparathyroidism. Uh, <clears throat> Shawnee Silverberg is going to give you um, a whirlwind hour of hyperpara. Um, uh, I um, don't know why we only have an hour of hyperpara, because we could give you 10 hours of hyperpara. Uh, but just very briefly as a way of introducing the subject, this is uh, one of the more common endocrine disorders associated with incompletely regulated excessive secretion of parathyroid hormone from one or more of the four parathyroid glands. 80% of adults with hyperpara will have a single benign adenoma. 15 to 20% will have multi-gland disease, most likely hyperplastic, but we see double adenomas, we see triple adenomas, uh, and very, very rarely, very, very rarely, we see parathyroid cancer. And parathyroid cancer is seen in about 0.5% of the hyperparathyroid population. These people present very differently. Yes, I know there are some who appear to have benign disease and histologically they might have parathyroid cancer, but classically, Parathyroid cancer presents with much higher blood calciums, typically 14 to 16 milligrams per deciliter. PTH levels that are sky high, you know, not 100 or 200 often. In fact, in our series, the average PTH was like 7 or 800. They typically have both bone disease and stone disease. And they're younger people. And the uh, sex breakdown is not 3 to 4 to 1, that is women to men. Uh, but in parathyroid cancer, it's more 1 to 1 men versus women. So it's a very different presentation than what we typically see. Uh, so we classically see this disease biochemically <clears throat> with hypercalcemia and elevated levels of parathyroid hormone. And that has been true <clears throat> up until we described the more recent phenotype of primary hyperpara, the so-called normal calcemic hyperpara, in which patients have normal serum calciums not occasionally, which is the case with regular hyperpara. People can have a normal calcium from time to time. I had a patient who was scheduled for parathyroid surgery, um, and she, her most recent calcium, just a week before parathyroid surgery, was normal. And she said to me, oh, I don't want surgery because my calcium is normal now. And I said, no, no, you have hyperparathyroidism. Uh, we see this from time to time the blood calcium can be normal. In normal calcemic hyperpara, however, the serum calcium is always normal, except in the 22% of patients who over time, seven years later, become hypercalcemic, because that is one of the natural histories of normal calcemic hyperparathyroidism. The word elevated, uh, you know what I mean by elevated, but when we try to explain this to non-endocrinologists, we don't really mean elevated. Yes, it could be frankly elevated, but it doesn't have to be. It can be clearly measurable, well within the normal range, but abnormal. Because anybody, as we talked about this morning, who has hypercalcemia should immediately, like, like that, 
within a microsecond, the PTH should drop. So typically non-PTH non dependent hypercalcemia is associated with undetectable PTH. So what's how low can you go? What would you say? A patient has a calcium of, um, I don't know, 10.9, 11. PTH is 50. That's within the normal limb range. You would say that's compatible with hyperpara. How about 40? Yeah? How about 30? You're wondering, huh? You're wondering a little bit? How about 20? You're really skeptical. Well, Andy Arnold has published a paper describing a patient with a PTH of 20, 22, consistently in the low 20s. And the patient had, patient had surgically proved primary hyperparathyroidism. You know, theoretically, any measurable PTH is abnormal if somebody who has uh, hypercalcemia. When you get to levels below 20, though, uh, then you're now wondering about the noise of the assay. Maybe these are, I don't know, immunoreactive fragments that are not really PTH or active PTH. So I would grant you um, levels under 20, I would uh, be skeptical. Another thing to bear in mind is, and this is never um, shown in the, uh, the data uh, when they give you the report, uh, but it happens to be true that um, PTH increases as we get older. There's an age-dependent increase in parathyroid hormone. We have a normal range, one size fits all, whatever that is, 10 to 65 picograms per ml. But in someone, and I like to use the 45 rule, somebody who's 45 or under should have a PTH that is no higher than 45. That's sort of a nice rule. So the typical functional range of parathyroid hormone in those under the age of 45, I take it more to be like 15 or 10 to 45, not 10 to 15 to 65. So a 40-year-old woman who has hypercalcemia and a PTH of 45, to me, that's at the very top, top, top of normal. It's so, okay, so it's nice to bear that little note in mind. And this is the nomogram that we typically talk about. Um, these are uh, people don't, denoted by P who have surgically proved hyperparathyroidism. And as we noted before, um, th there are people whose PTH levels are uh, in the upper range of normal, uh, normal being in the top of this box. Uh, in this particular series, there was nobody who had normal calcemic hyperpara. They all had hypercalcemia. And this nomogram also nicely, uh, this pointer doesn't work because it's retrograde pro projection. This um, nicely uh, distinguishes hyperpara from these people denoted by Ts. And these are people with hypercalcemia malignancy. And so the assay really works very nicely to distinguish between hyperpara and the other major cause of hypercalcemia uh, malignancy. It distinguishes. Uh, between PTH and PTHRP. This assay does not pick up PTHRP. The assay we use is um, it's long, it's very old. It was first developed in 1986, so a 30-year-old assay. It's been perfected. They have played with it a little bit, but it's essentially the same assay that measures both the active peptide, 1 to 84, and um, some of the um, circulating metabolites, the most important one of which is the big peptide, PTH7 to 84. Uh, PTH7 to 84 is not biologically active. It does circulate. And um, under certain conditions, like renal failure, that an inactive metabolite can build up and give you a false um, measure. Um, did Tom tell you, talk to you about how you can know whether you're dealing with um, high bone turnover renal disease or low bone turnover renal disease and what his cut points are for PTH. Because the Cadigo guidelines are generally useful. If the PTH, you know, in my, I'm not a nephrologist, obviously, but if the PTH, which would include this inactive PTH 784 fragment, is over 750 or 800, you're dealing with high turnover disease. You're dealing with hyperparathyroidism. If the PTH is 200 or 150 or less, even though that's high, it's not high for someone in renal failure. And those are the people who tend to have low turnover disease. 
for a, day, a dynamic disease. In the big middle, you know, between 200 and 600 or 700, that's where it gets to be really difficult to know whether you're dealing with what kind of renal loss to dystrophy. And in that, those situations, the PTH assay doesn't help that much. You could try the other assay, which is measuring only PTH 1 to 84. That's called the whole assay, W-H-O-L-E. And that is available in some labs. And that can be helpful because it doesn't pick up that inactive metabolite, PTA 784. Um, and maybe it'll help uh, more in distinguishing the forms of renal bone disease, but not always. All right, so again, you're going to learn much more about hyperpara um, in the next days to come. Uh, this is a very old um, slide of a patient uh, who had ovarian cancer, and she comes in with a calcium of you know, 12 to 13, and you can see they gave her saline, they gave her furosemide. In those days, they used, used phosphate. We don't use phosphate anymore. Um, and nothing, nothing happened. She's still hypercalcemic until they took out the ovarian tumor. And as, immediately, the serum calcium corrected. In fact, she went down even below normal. So this was um, seen in the 40s and 50s. And in fact, Fuller Albright, um, who is still the great man in our field, in the 40s, he came up with this idea that these tumors are synthesizing and secreting, he called them humors, that stimulate osteoclast-mediated bone resorption. And he actually looked for these humors, and he thought it was PTH. Uh, he had a bioassay. He couldn't measure PTH in 1942. But he had a bioassay and um, tested the material from these tumors. And um, they, didn't, uh, they didn't seem to be PTH. Very interesting. So he said, I still think it's PTH, but I can't, I can't be sure. This was now. It was really quite amazing that he would be thinking about these things and wondering whether it really was PTH or not. And now we know, of course, that it isn't PTH. There are very, very few examples of authentic PTH being secreted by a malignant tumor. I think there's a hepatoma that was once described, maybe an adenocarcinoma of the ovary once. But typically, you don't measure PTH. Now, this is a sequence uh, cartoon. Uh, the bottom four are PTHs, and the top row is PTHRP. And what this slide shows are a couple of things. The top row, you can see, extends well beyond 84. So PTHRP is a much bigger molecule than is PTH, our good old friend PTH. PTHRP shares with all these other PTHs in this pink area rather strict sequence homology. And even if the amino acid isn't the same, um, it's sort of the same. It, it doesn't change the configuration of the peptide. And the reason why PTHRP uh, seems to behave like PTH in many situations is because it looks like PTH biologically, and in fact, it binds to the same receptor. <clears throat> when you get beyond residue 13 or 14, you can see now that the top line becomes very different from the bottom four, and the sequence homology becomes quite divergent. <clears throat> and of course, then the additional length of the peptide. So in some ways, PTHRP is like PTH, and in other ways, it's not like PTH at all. The, uh, Proof that PTHRP is an etiology of humoral hypercalcemia malignancy is pretty clear now. Um, it's been extracted, it's been shown to be made by the tumor. You can correlate blood levels with the degree of hypercalcemia, uh, giving PTHRP in experimental settings. Uh, animals mimics the syndrome. And if you relieve the tumor burden surgically, um, PTHRP will come down, and uh, the hypercalcemia will remit. Uh, 
And um, they don't all, uh, not all tumors are associated with PTHRP. Uh, T cell lymphomas uh, often, squamous cell cancer often, adeno sometimes, breast cancer sometimes, and not often are myeloma and other hematological malignancies. Uh, the story about PTHRP is interesting because it was discovered in the context of a search for the cause of hypercalcemia. But as that was discovered, it was then appreciated that if you look for PTHRP in all these different tissues, in chicken, rat, and human, you find PTHRP everywhere. It's kind of ubiquitous. And uh, it brings up the question as to whether a PTHRP, like PTH, um, is a pleiotrophic factor, and whether it has actions in many tissues besides the skeleton. And in fact, there's been a huge industry of interest on how PTHRP might influence other systems. In fact, as D. Cohen talked about on Monday, it's very important in lactation. There is a ton of PTHRP in milk. And if um, Jack Martin and Arthur Broadus and Arthur, Andy Stewart, uh, when they isolated PTHRP uh, from these malignant tumors, if they had known that they could go down to the local Wawa or 7-Eleven and buy a gallon of milk, that's where it is. They could have isolated the material much more easily, but they only learned that later. PTHRP is clearly uh, a very important factor in neonatal development. It's a placental transporter of calcium, lactation, and then it has other effects, skin differentiation, chondrocyte development, smooth mass function, and suction and CNS. So it, it has a, a very important role. It's not just a bad actor. It does uh, very good things in terms of development. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, you do see other causes of hypercalcemia. Medication-induced hypercalcemia should be very easy to figure out because you've asked the question, and you will find out that the patient's been on lithium, thiazide, diuretics, these two, by the way, we used to think that um, those two drugs um, unmasked uh, hyperpara, but when you stopped these drugs, these people would go back to normal. That, that was teaching 20 years ago. Now, it's pretty clear that if you dare stop lithium, that's a problem if somebody needs lithium, but you can stop thiazide diuretics. Most of the time, these people do not become normal calcemic. What you've done is to unmask the hyperparathyroidism, and it stays. The patient remains hypercalcemic. So no longer do we say, you know, thiazide-associated hypercalcemia, stop the thiazide, the cal hypercalcemia will remit. It happens, but very, very unusually. We used to say 50-50, now I would say almost always. It stays. Uh, we've talked about um, vitamin D, vitamin A. Uh, so CYP24A1 deficiency. Um, Tom Jacobs, who's in our group, um, and I and a few others published this paper in JCNM, and it was entitled um, 30 Years of Unexplained Hypercalcemia Finally Explained, something like that. And this was a man who had unexplained hypercalcemia for 30 years. Uh, this man had multiple kidney stones, had marked hypercalcuria, had consistently undetectable PTH levels, and 125 dihydroxy levels that were high. But he didn't have any of these granulomatous diseases. He wasn't taking calcitriol. He wasn't taking regular vitamin D. Um, but he had a high 125 dihydroxy. And so, uh, it, as we learned a little bit more about vitamin D metabolism, we learned that this enzyme is very important in the inactivation pathway of vitamin D. And you remember that sequence. So 25 hydroxy vitamin D doesn't always go to 125 dihydroxy. The liver metabolizes it to 24, 25 
dihydroxyvitamin D, which is an inactive metabolite of vitamin D. Well, in this particular genetic disease, this enzyme that's responsible for the inactivation pathway from 25-hydroxy to 24-25-dihydroxy is not working. So what happens is that the 25-hydroxy, more than it should, gets converted to 125-dihydroxy. So there is now an easy way you can measure 24-25-dihydroxy vitamin D commercially, and you can get a ratio of 24-25 to or basically it's 25-hydroxy to 24-25-dihydroxy. And I can't remember what the ratio is, so I said, I can't remember what the ratio is. But some ratio <clears throat> that clearly indicates that the, there might be an enzyme deficiency state. And then <clears throat> there are several research labs, uh, Glenville Jones in Canada. There's a group from Germany that can, if you're nice to them, they can do the sequence and show you that this is um, uh, an enzyme deficiency state. So we have made the diagnosis in that one patient, and then I've recently seen another patient in whom we made the diagnosis. And there now is a fairly uh, pretty common literature that these cases are no longer worthy of a report because we've seen uh, so much of it. <clears throat> so let me ask you. You made the diagnosis, and this patient is hypercalcemic, hypercalciuric, has kidney stones, and has a high 125 dihydroxy. How are you going to treat him? Is there any way you can think about to uh, deal with the pathway and reduce the 125 dihydroxy? Steroids? Hmm? Well, you could use steroids, yeah, but the problem with steroids is the problem with steroids. You can do it, but you're not going to do it forever. But is it, yeah, you can try steroids, but how about uh, ketoconazole? Actually, ketoconazole is a very good drug for this. It will control the hypercalcemia. It will reduce, it will alter the pathway, another pathway, such that the 125 is, um, is low. And you can control it. And this particular patient that Tom reported uh, was put on ketoconazole. And he did very, very well. Calcium normalized in his urinary calcium drop. I had my patient who, in whom I've made the diagnosis, I offered ketoconazole. And the problem, you know, we live in an age where everybody's smart, everybody has all the information. And this patient said to me, Dr. B, I checked with Dr. G. You know who Dr. G is? Dr. Google. And I read the package insert on ketoconazole. This stuff will destroy my liver. The, didn't you know that this drug causes liver failure? Yeah, there's been what, one case, two cases? It's in the package insert. It's a warning. He said, I'm out of here. I'm not going to take this drug. I said, OK, it's your choice. I mean, I'm not going to force you. It's very rare, liver, very severe liver toxicity has been reported with ketoconazole. Uh, but Everything has troubles. I mean, you know, so I mean, life is benefit risk. Uh, but I think it's really a good drug for people in whom you might make this diagnosis. But don't forget this. It's an interesting part of the differential diagnosis, uh, particularly, obviously, in people who have an unexplained high 125 dihydroxy, have hypercalciuria and kidney stones. If you get that combination and you ruled out these granulomatous diseases, I would go very hard to think about this enzyme deficiency. All right. So the symptoms of hypercalcemia are here by organ system, constitutional, CNS, GI, renal, cardiovascular. You know, because you know, we deal with this on, on the wards. Um, the factors that lead to symptomatic hypercalcemia are the calcium itself. The higher the calcium, the more likely the patient is going to be symptomatic. How quickly it rises, you can take a patient whose serum calcium is 8.5, and, and if it's a severe malignancy and he becomes dehydrated, what have you, the calcium goes up to 12 or 13, and that patient can be symptomatically hypercalcemic. On the other hand, 
I had a patient, again back to my NIH days, the patient took the train from New York to NIH as his want every six months for his checkup for parathyroid cancer. He lived with a calcium of 15 to 16. That was his actual, that was his regular level. He could not get his calcium below 15, 16 milligrams per deciliter. Comes in a Sunday night, we checked his bloods, and I get this urgent call. Doctor, your patient's calcium is 20. So I went to see him. He said, uh, Doctor, you're working late tonight. What's the problem? I said, well, I've been told that your calcium is 20. How do you feel? He says, I feel fine. Uh, I'm a little more thirsty than usual, but other than that, I'm okay. So why was he relatively asymptomatic and the person whose calcium rose quickly to 12 was symptomatic? It has to do with getting used to whatever level you're at and then whether or not you're changing a lot. So he was used to a very high level and even though he went up a little bit, he wasn't being affected. So the rate of rise is very important. And how long the patient has been hypercalcemic and this individual variability. I mean, you know this yourself. When you go on and see patients who are hypercalcemic for the same level of calcium, somebody may have symptoms and somebody may not. So what is going on with the pathophysiology of hypercalcemia? Starting with some stimulus, and as I said, before, osteoclast activation is almost always present. Uh, the kidneys participate if it's related to PTH or PTHRP, as I mentioned before, because PTH or, and PTHRP are calcium conserving hormones. So they'll pull back calcium into the system. If it's a vitamin D mediated hypercalcemia, yeah, the GI tract can participate. And as these people become more and more debilitated, and become less and less ambulatory, being immobile or relatively immobile can lead to more severe hypercalcemia because of the negative calcium balance. And then we begin to see symptoms. We begin to see polyuria. By the way, one of the questions on the board exam a while ago was a patient coming in with polyuria polydipsia, and you're supposed to think diabetes mellitus as the first three things in your mind. But in that particular case that I remember, it was not hyperglycemia, it was hypercalcemia. Because if these people can present with polyuria, polydipsia, anorexia. And as that occurs, they begin to reduce their fluid intake because they're nauseated. But they're continuing to have polyuria. So then what happens, and this is the, where everything falls apart, they become dehydrated. And once they become dehydrated, their plasma volume gets reduced. They don't filter the calcium, uh, and the calcium in the blood becomes rapidly worse. So that's a pretty straightforward pathophysiology of uh, how symptomatic hypercalcemia develops. So this is an interesting question, and I'd like to get your thoughts about it. Um, these are corrected calciums. Uh, take a normal range of 8.4 to 10.2. Um, and you're called because the patient has altered mental status. And your, the house staff says this patient has symptomatic hypercalcemia. And you go to the, and you check, and the calcium is less than 12, uh, 11, 11.5. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts about whether or not the constitutional symptoms are or are not likely to be due to the serum calcium elevated but less than 12 milligrams per deciliter? Well, how do you think about that number? Well, what you saying earlier, some people get 8.5 and they shoot up. Okay, good. Yeah, so you're right. So maybe, maybe you need to look back and see what was the calcium a couple of days ago, and if the calcium was eight or nine, and all of a sudden it's 12, yeah, I, make, I would agree with you, there could well be. But let's say that's not the case. Let's say that you check back, and the calcium has been running 11 to 12 since the admission, and the altered mental status is not since admission. What I'm trying to get you to think about is, well, maybe not, maybe not. And you know, we're so tuned into um, drawing conclusions 
that is, it's got to be that because it is associated with that. But that we forget sometimes that there are many other reasons why somebody could have altered mental status. And uh, I like to think a little bit more broadly. Yeah, it could be. It could be the hypercalcemia, but let's look at uh, the other thing. You know, this patient, you know, what's the deal? With, what, why is the patient in the hospital? What are the other factors that could um, account for altered mental status? So my feeling is I'm generally skeptical if the uh, calcium is under 12. Um, I'm skeptical that I can clearly relate the symptoms to the serum calcium level. That's my opinion, but you might disagree. When the calcium is between 12 and 14, now you're, uh, it's the, the burden of proof is on you to say this is not symptomatic hypercalcemia. Because uh, many people with calciums 12 to 14 are symptomatic. So if you don't think that's the reason, well, you better give some good reasons. Well, this patient has had calciums of 12 to 14 for as long as we've been checking, and nothing has changed, and yet this altered mental status has uh, become evident. Uh, more likely than not, our house staff, our fellows, will take action um, if the calcium is 12 to 14. And then if the calcium is greater than 14, and here's the other piece of this discussion. Even if the patient is not symptomatic, okay, you can have a serum calcium that's over 14, and the patient may not be symptomatic. Would you treat? Would you? Yeah? You would. Okay, so the patient feels fine, calcium's 15, and you're going to treat with, well, we're going to talk about how we're going to treat. Yeah, I don't have a problem with yeah. Hmm? I'm sorry. I would ask an HEG. Yeah. Okay. All right. That would force your hand, maybe. Okay. Maybe. And uh, these are the general approaches. Um, these are general, not specific. Um, obviously, we want to rehydrate because these people are always dehydrated. Um, we use saline because. Um, you want to induce a saleuresis, which will induce a calciuresis. So sodium and calcium go along together in the tubule. Uh, if um, you're worried about the fluid intake, um, you could use a loop diuretic. You don't always have to use a loop diuretic. Dialysis is always an option, although it's very difficult to maneuver sometimes. And mobilization. As soon as you can get your patient to be mobilized, that's good. But what you really want to do, uh, specifically, is to, I'm sorry, you want to affect that osteoclast. That's that multinucleated giant cell that's eating up bone. The specific therapy is designed to affect the activity of that overactive um, osteoclast. And on the right are the agents that um, are available or used to be available. And um, heading the top of the list is, uh, are the bisphosphonates and denosumab. Uh, the, two, the two bisphosphonates that are uh, used, zoledronic acid and pomidronate. Um, and you know, you know these drugs there powerful osteoclast inhibitors. For hypercalcemia, we always use the intravenous route, zoledronic acid. Uh, the drugs don't work immediately. It takes 24 to 36 hours before you'll see an effect of these bisphosphonates. And they vary in terms of how long you can control the hypercalcemia. And these are the two drugs. And this is an example of famidronate. Uh, over time, seven days showing serum calcium, this is in millimoles per liter, 3.5 is about 14 milligrams per deciliter. And you can see in these background individual plots that serum calcium nicely comes down. Uh, there have been some head-to-head -head studies of zoledronate and pomidronate, uh, and it turns out that these were two doses of uh, zoledronic acid 
both showing a better effect than pomidronate, and in this slide, even a prolonged effect um, in terms of pr maintaining the normal, the reduced calcium level, a longer mean period of time with both of these doses of zoledronic acid versus the uh, dose of pomidronate. So the uh, bisphosphonate can, IV can cause a temperature elevation. You need to know about that because if patients develop a fever, of course, the house staff will embark on the usual workup, but it may not be necessary. Leukopenia can occur, the phosphate can go down, and if you give too much of these bisphosphonates, you can overshoot. Um, we've had a few examples, not good examples, of patients whose serum calcium dropped um, from 15 to hypocalcemic levels after getting 90 milligrams of pomidronate. So you do have to watch that um, because sometimes these people will overreact. So genosumab um, is also available for the treatment of hypercalcemia of malignancy. Um, this is a study that was published a few years ago. Uh, interesting study, a small number of patients with solid tumors or hematological malignancies. They all had received bisphosphonates. This is where the study is a little bit unclear, but they had received IV bisphosphonate for about uh, seven or 30 days before and were thought to be refractory. So they were not responding to bisphosphonate. Uh, DMAB was given 120 milligrams on days 1, 8, 15, 29, and then every four weeks thereafter. And the end point was what percentage of subjects had their serum calcium that averaged 13.6 milligrams per deciliter, what percentage got down to less than 11.5 by day 10. And this is the slide showing after the first dose, you can see then the calcium really nicely comes down and stays down, in fact, goes down well into the normal range over this period of time. Uh, the effect was attributed to donosumab because it occurred coincident with the administration of DMAP. But remember, there is an antecedent history of bisphosphonate on board also. So it's not clear to me whether this was in part a related effect of bisphosphonate, perhaps a prolonged effect or some kind of combination effect that we weren't appreciative of. So when you have a patient with hypercalcemia and you're going to treat, what, what, are, you, are, you, what are you using these days? Are you using IV Zol? Are you using IV Pomidronate? Or are you using denosumab? Zolidronate. Any of you using DMAB? No? You are? I, yeah, so we don't have zolidronic ah. acid inpatient. Uh, it's not worth trying to fight with them. Sure, that's uh, true. So I've used, yeah, so I've used pomidronate sometimes, but when I request for the denosumab and I have, there's like the, the non-formulary committee has an endocrinologist, so I always call them and I just give them his, he'll always say yes to me, so I just Good. give them the name. And then it comes in, and I, I had a patient with PTHRP um, from small cell, uh, like unknown primary, who got two doses of bisphosphonate and it wasn't really um, coming below like 13 and a half. Um, Denosumab worked like a charm. Then he got a little hypocalcemic. He's also just deathly ill anyway. Mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. so you have a connection. Yeah, a little few. Like you got to grease the skids of the pharmacy and like mm -hmm. make them your best yeah. friends. Well, DMAB is, yeah. is yeah. So, and zoledronic acid, that's another issue because it's, if it's not on formulary, it's hard to get. Um, DMAB has a label now. The label has been changed. You can use it for hypercalcemia of malignancy. It's an approved use. Uh, but our experience has much more been with zoledronic acid than with DMAB. Um, this is the result of that study. 13.6 milligrams per deciliter um, was the average. Everybody was over 12 and a half. And a good percentage, 64% got down to below 11.5, 33% got to below 10.8, and at some point during the study, 70% got to that primary target or level. And the median duration of response was not bad. I have a question. Does it matter the of malignancy? Does it matter if it's more from having metastases or bone destruction versus PT? Yeah. No, I don't think it does. You know, we used to talk about humoral hypercalcemia malignancy, 
that was sort of defined by patients who were hypercalcemic with a defined malignancy but didn't have any overt metastases versus the, the myeloma type uh, where there is clearly bone involvement. And that really hasn't, um, it's not really useful operationally. Um, there's got to be bone loss, whether you see it or not. And whether it's due to direct tumor destruction or whether it's due to a circulating PTHRP. And I don't think um, you can distinguish that as a, as a predictor of response. The predictor of response, I think, is the, um, the activity of the process, whatever the malignancy is. Obviously, the more aggressive the malignancy, uh, the much more difficult it is to take care of these people. So I think it's more that, how aggressive is the tumor, as opposed to whether we're dealing with direct tumor invasion of bone versus the cytokine mediated hypercalcemia. <laughs> I have a question. So if we give the nosumab and patients become hypocalcemic, for how long they will remain hypocalcemic? That's a problem. I, I'm going to hold that thought. Hold that thought. I, I, the answer is maybe a long time and maybe a short time. But there's, there's more to it. All right. So now you don't know about this drug. And it's not available to you. It's off the market. But I like to show this. This is a very potent, and we used to use it a lot, osteoclast inhibitor. Works very quickly, given intravenously. And um, the reason why I show it is for this experience. Now, this is a slide that goes back to 1983. Um, those of you who are from New York, there's one of the, um, I don't know if, he, if he's, um, He's CBS News. Jonathan LaPook, the doctor. Dr. LaPook. <laughs> Dr. LaPook. Uh, he's now at NYU. He was here for years. Jonathan LaPook was um, the resident on this case, 1983. Patient comes in, and you see those data points up there? Those were repeated three times. The serum calcium was 26.3. Corrected calcium was 26.3. The man was 74 years old, brought in by his granddaughter, with the chief complaint, I don't feel well. Uh, he was awake, though. And um, we repeated, you see the three dots there? Clearly repeated. We, not to make a joke of this, but it's kind of cute to call this in a case of monumental hypercalcemia, because this man was turning into a monument. I mean, you know, can you imagine what the calcium phosphate product was with this guy? All right, so we started hydration with saline, watching carefully, because who knows how much fluid he could tolerate. And we gave one dose of plecomycin, and then 12 hours later, another dose of plecomycin. We continued to give him fluid, never gave him a loop diuretic, never gave him a loop diuretic. And his calcium, um, you can see how beautifully his calcium came down into the normal range. In those days, people stayed in the hospital forever, you see? In the hospital, he's being worked up. Um, and his calcium starts to go up again. And then he has his curative surgery. What's the diagnosis? Curative surgery. He lived another five years and died of something else. Parathyroid, no, parathyroid what? Cancer. No, but you're close. He had primary hyperparathyroidism. He had a benign disease. He had a single parathyroid adenoma. It makes a very important point, and I get back to Jonathan LaPook. He will, not, he will deny this. But um, there was a discussion about what the etiology of this was. And this man looked too well. There was something healthy about this man, as opposed to someone who's not healthy. You know, we, we should be able to tell the difference, who's well and who's not well. And I had a funny feeling that this was hyperpara. Some of the highest calciums in the world's literature have been due to benign disease, hyperpara. And obviously, think of benign disease before you think of malignant disease. So. Um, there was discussion about this, and it turned out that um, he had hyperpara, he had his adenoma removed, and he went home. It's a true story. 
Yeah. Did he complain kind of hypoparasitism? No, no, he didn't, but that's a very good point. Um, uh, I, we had a patient um, who um, uh, had unsuccessful parathyroid surgery from a hospital in uh, New Jersey, and the patient um, came in to that hospital in New Jersey with a calcium of like 16 or 17, and after the unsuccessful surgery, the surgeon was very close to the gland but didn't find it. Postoperatively, the patient's calcium went up to 25. She was brought over the bridge, the George Washington Bridge, to us, and um, we, uh, we immediately operated on her and found this very big parathyroid adenoma. Overnight, her calcium dropped to like 12, right around here, and she became tetanic. She became tetanic, even though she was still hypercalcemic. So as the rate of rise can lead to symptoms of hypercalcemia, the rate of fall of a serum calcium can lead to symptoms of hypocalcemia, even in people who are still hypercalcemic. And that's your point. This guy, no, he didn't, but the uh, other patient did. All right, but you don't have plecomycin. I just showed that as a teaching point for some of the things we learned. Calcitonin, we do have. And interestingly about calcitonin is that it is an osteoclast inhibitor. That's good. It also is a calciuretic. That is, it leads to a loss of urinary calcium. So in a way, you've got the perfect drug. Um, you've got a drug that blocks calcium-mediated, uh, uh, osteoclast-mediated bone resorption, and you have a drug that facilitates urinary calcium excretion. It can be given IV, sub-Q. We'll give it by weight base, or you can give 200 units IM, or I sub-Q anyway. Um, you can do it weight, or you don't have to. And you do see a rapid decline uh, within 12 hours. The problem with calcitonin is that it's relatively weak and it doesn't last very long. And this is an example. Um, and you'll, the average serum calcium was like 12 and a half. And yeah, the calcium drops very quickly from 12 and a half to like 11-ish uh, within two hours. And then it basically stays. So as a single approach to symptomatic hypercalcemia, I'm not very wild about calcitonin. But I do like the idea that it works very rapidly. And you know, these people often need some drug that's going to work quickly. The bisphosphonates don't work that quickly. Denosumab doesn't work that quickly. Uh, but um, this drug does. So uh, one could think about combination therapy. And we uh, often will use a combination of calcitonin and a bisphosphonate. Um, and the reason for doing it is to take advantage of the speed of calcitonin and the potency of the bisphosphonate. And uh, that's shown here. This is an old slide that basically shows a combination of calcitonin and a bisphosphonate. And you see the early, the early fall in the serum calcium is likely due to the calcitonin. And then the further drop in the calcium is likely due to bisphosphonate. So do you tend to use combination therapy? Yeah, I think it's a, it makes sense. Um, uh, very safe, calcitonin, an easy drug, and it, it takes the edge off the hypercalcemia. Uh, but um, it, while the bisphosphonate is kicking in, you have advantage of, of uh, dealing with the, uh, uh, that early severe hypercalcemia. Glucocorticoids, um, in certain situations, vitamin D-related hypercalcemia, glucocorticoids can be very helpful. Um, certain patients with myeloma can respond very nicely to glucocorticoids. Uh, some breast cancers respond to glucocorticoids. So in, if you know what the etiology is, and it's one of those, you could consider it. And then, it, of course, this is all palliative. If you can deal with what the problem is, you want to get to that. Unfortunately, a lot of these people are you know, end stage, and there uh, may not be any therapeutic plans to deal with the underlying problem. So your, how aggressive you're going to be in managing the hypercalcemia is going to be influenced by the plan, the plan for the patient. Um, um, and that's the judgment call that you aren't going to make yourself, but the, the managing team um, is going to make it. Okay. Um, 
unless you guys have a theater tickets or something for tonight, can't we? <laughs> we could go on a little bit more. Okay. All right. Let's talk about hypocalcemia. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, you know, just as exciting as hypercalcemia. Uh, deficient secretion of parathyroid hormone uh, can lead to hypocalcemia, or this can be due to an appropriate response to hypocalcemic stimulus that isn't related to the parathyroid glands. And we call that a secondary hyperparathyroidism. And it gets very confusing because we're not talking about hypercalcemia here. We're talking about people who are hypocalcemic, but they're responding to the hypocalcemic stimulus appropriately by an increase in the PTH. So the differential diagnosis, um, this is the box of normality, and this is hypoparathyroidism, defined by a low calcium and a low PTH. And this is secondary hyperparathyroidism, defined in this way by a low calcium but a high PTH. Now, many people with renal disease will have serum calciums that are more in the normal range, low normal range, and they'll have high uh, PTH. So we call that secondary hyperparathyroidism too. You don't have to be hypocalcemic, uh, but in the frank severe causes, um, you will see frank hypocalcemia and a high PTH. So if the PTH is low, the diagnosis is hypopara. Um, we do see is sometimes the low serum magnesium that can mimic hypopara, and I'm going to show you an example of that. Um, if the parathyroid hormone level is high and the calcium is low, we talk about secondary or compensatory hyperparathyroidism. So this is the um, kind of the differential diagnosis of hypocalcemia. We think about vitamin D in many ways, nutritionally, malabsorption, liver disease, renal disease. We have vitamin D resistance, um, different uh, genetic forms of vitamin D resistance. A certain drugs can be associated with vitamin D, uh, with hypocalcemia, and we have the genetic disease hypo, uh, pseudo hypoparathyroidism. So uh, let's. Uh, this is hypopara. This is secondary. So uh, hypopara, and uh, Michelle is going to talk about this in some length on Thursday. Um, but the etiologies, and this isn't in the order of frequency, but this can be an autoimmune disease. Uh, either as an isolated parathyroid deficiency uh, disease or it can be multiple end organ endocrine deficiency. 75% of patients with hypoparathyroidism will have post-surgical hypopara. Um, the, po the surgery is obviously anterior neck surgery. Uh, most of these people have had thyroid surgery, but a good percentage of these people have had parathyroid surgery and some have had anterior neck surgery for other reasons. Uh, I remember a patient who came with hypopara, and um, in the course of the history, I asked her what you would ask her, have you ever had neck surgery? And she said, no, doctor, I've never had neck surgery. Okay. So then I got the rest of the history, and I went to examine her, and I see a nice horizontal scar here. I said to her, well, what is, what's that? She said, oh, I forgot. I had a thyroid operation 30 years ago. A very interesting point about this story. One, she forgot. People forget. 30 years ago, she didn't remember. Second, you can develop hypoparathyroidism years after the event. And you have to sort of do some fancy thinking about, well, what was happening? She was probably left with a little gland, small remaining parathyroid. Um, if it was thyroid surgery, maybe the surgeon took out three glands, maybe took out three and a half glands. For whatever reason, she's left with a little bit of functioning parathyroid tissue, and she lives for 20 years. She lives for 30 years. And then something happens over time. What is it? The vascular supply gets compromised. Something happens. That last little bit of tissue can't do it anymore, and they become, frankly, hypopara. So post-surgical hypopara is defined as hypocalcemia with low PTH for at least six months after the event, the surgery. But it can be six months or it can be 30 years after the surgery. 
Um, and uh, there are many rare uh, processing defects that are associated with difficulty in the gene or the secretion or the transcription of the gene or the trafficking of the parathyroid molecule in the parathyroid cell. We talked about the activating mutations of the calcium receptor. Uh, both in terms of the receptor and antibodies, and then there's congenital hypopara. The best example is de Georges syndrome. Uh, magnesium deficiency we touched upon before. Uh, both deficiency and excess can cause hypopara transiently. Um, we were called to the uh, OB floor um, a few years ago, uh, 20 years ago. Um, for uh, a rash of pregnant women who were being treated with magnesium for, to control premature labor. And they were titanic. Um, and so what was going on there? And so we checked their magnesium levels. And their lab levels were very high. The OBs were, and I don't know how it is nowadays, but the OBs were just giving magnesium until labor stops. Do you still do that? No. Good. <laughs> but in the old days, you guys did. And you stopped labor, and you stopped everything else sometimes. <laughs> and so what happened was the high bag was blocked, literally, like it's a divalent cation. It was behaving like calcium. And it was shutting off parathyroid hormone. So these people were becoming, and were, functionally hypoparathyroid. Um, and now, the, I think OBs have learned from our paper in the New England Journal that you want to titrate, be careful with the use of IV magnesium to control premature labor. There are infiltrative diseases. Um, one of the nephrologists called me just last week, um, Tom, one of Tom Nicholas's colleagues. Um, he said um, they, there was a patient who has something, some kind of vascular disease. The renal function is normal. And uh, they were starting the patient on some kind of a calcium channel blocker. Uh, I don't know what it was. And the, um, the nephrology fellow said, um, it's probably the drug. Because they looked up in the package insert, and there's been one case of hypocalcemia, hypoparathyroidism, due to this drug. It didn't make any sense to me. Anyway, and then the nephrology uh, colleague says, oh, by the way, she has amyloid. I said, oh, really? Oh, with this extensive man amyloid. Amyloid in the kidney, amyloid in the heart. I'm sure she has amyloid in the parathyroids. It's been described. And that's probably why she developed hypoparathyroidism. OK, um, by the way, um, this is very rare. I-131 therapy for hyperthyroidism almost never, hardly ever, is associated with hypopara. The parathyroid glands are extremely radio-resistant, uh, and you cannot irradiate the parathyroid glands and destroy them. It almost never happens. OK, magnesium deficiency. Now, so this is another old example of somebody who came to the hospital. And um, he was um, not one of our best citizens. He had many problems. Um, and uh, this was noted, a serum calcium of 7, and then it was lower. Um, and they gave him calcium lactate. They gave him vitamin D. And nothing happened until the um, apocryphal medical student takes a history, as the story goes, and um, says to um, the, the patient, uh, it turns out that he's had an alcohol problem, hadn't been eating, was nutritionally very deficient. And the medical student said, well, let's check the magnesium. And the magnesium was really low, was point I think it was 0.5. And then he was given magnesium, magnesium. And you can see, as the magnesium comes up, his serum calcium normalized. And that's classic. That's classic. You can have hypopara due to hypermagnesemia acutely. Or more commonly, in an acute care hospital, you can have it due to hypomagnesemia. And what's happening is two things, one or three things. One, you measure the PTH in these people, and it's undetectable. Undetectable. So they have low calcium, low PTH, they have hypoparathyroidism. You give them magnesium, shown up there, and immediately, literally, immediately, within a minute or two, 
the PTH level is detectable. It goes up. And that's because the, the, um, there's a secretory block. And when, when you give magnesium, you relieve that secretory block. And the PTH, which is formed in the parathyroid cells, can come out. It takes a while, however, before the calcium will go up because there's a peripheral resistance um, to PTH. So it isn't just a matter of relieving the block, but giving time for the skeleton to become normally responsive. And during this time, you have to cover these people with calcium. You can't just give magnesium. There's also a thought that the magnesium might um, interfere with vitamin D activation. And that may be the third mechanism uh, for the hypocalcemia. So uh, those are the points I just made. Um, and what you want to do is deal with the signs and symptoms associated hypocalcemia deal with take care of the hypokalemia because that's very common in hypomagnesemia there's a loss of potassium these people can become markedly hypokalemic losing potassium through the kidneys and you need to deal with that and then um, replace the total body magnesium deficit but not not at the time you're taking care of these people eventually when they're eating and nutritionally sufficient uh, they will uh, be okay. Now, let me take, uh, just throw this in, a special therapeutic situation. Very special situation. And um, this situation happened on April 27th, Friday. So I want to keep you up to date. I was called on April 27th in desperation by a woman who developed symptomatic hypocalcemia after receiving a single dose of denosumab. So, that's interesting. What situations might lead to hypocalcemia after denosumab? If you've read the package insert and the couple of case reports, by, by the way, in the spirit of full disclosure, I was the uh, chair of the Data and Safety Monitoring Board for this drug, so I saw this happening before anybody and it would happen under very special situations. Uh, so tell me about the special situations where you can develop severe hypocalcemia after the administration of denosumab. Low vitamin D. Good, very good. Low vitamin D, very, very important. So anybody who gets DMAP, you've got to check their vitamin D. And I'm telling you again, make sure it's over 30. <laughs> Please, don't give it to somebody who's 20. You just, you're just asking for trouble. Good point. Make sure their vitamin D is sufficient. And then the other, um, with, uh, with or without, uh, with the D deficiency, without D deficiency, there's another um, w uh, warning. Um, it's a cautionary note. Renal failure. Good. Renal failure. Now, we, we love this drug because you can use it in renal failure. And that's great. But that's, there's a very important cautionary note. Be careful, because in renal failure, if the clearance is less than 30 cc's a minute, patients can develop hypocalcemia. In the clinical trial that led to the approval of denosumab, um, we saw seven cases, and they were all um, related to either uh, vitamin D deficiency and or renal uh, insufficiency. We never saw hypocalcemia in people who were vitamin D sufficient and were renal, had a normal or relatively normal renal function. So please bear that in mind uh, when you're um, thinking about denosumab. Well, this patient had a normal vitamin D. And this patient's creatinine clearance is 95. Okay. And you've got these, so this is very good. So vitamin D deficiency, renal failure, combination of vitamin D deficiency and renal failure. So let me tell you what happened. Subclinical hypopara. Let me tell you about this. This is really an interesting case. She's 51 years old, status post two parathyroidectomies in 2015 and in the fall two adenomas and one normal gland were removed, not at our hospital. 
I'm not taking any blame for this. Uh, and her calcium and PTH were normal thereafter. Renal function is normal. Her T-score of the lumbar spine is minus 3.4, and she's had a fracture. So the doctor decided to give her denosumab. Um, low, it's a very low T-score. She's had a fracture. She's a perfectly fine candidate, uh, and it's appropriate. So she gets DMAB, 60 milligrams, end of December of last year. Uh, soon thereafter, she became symptomatically hypocalcemic to a calcium of 7, corrected, and her PTH was 18. So what do you think about this? Hmm? Yeah, correct. So her with a calcium of 7 that has dropped, it was normal before, to drops to 7, the PTH is 18, so... In regular people who get denosumab, does this, with the transient hypocalcemia... Correct. Well, it's a very good point. Uh, good point, and we'll talk about that. Um, the calcium always goes down with DMAB, but it's not enough for you to measure. You will not measure hypocalcemia typically with DMAB. But what you will measure typically with DMAB is a doubling of the PTH. At 60 milligrams, within three months, the PTH doubles. Three months? Eh, three months, yeah. One, two, three months. And it stays up for the three, three of the six months of the denosumab period. The PTH will be double whatever it was. Now, typically, it's not going to be abnormal. You know, if, it's tw if the PTH is 50, 25, it'll go up to 50. The, I believe that's a compensation for the mild hypocalcemia that occurs in everybody with this very potent anti-resorptive. Now this patient, who has one parathyroid gland left, and I have no idea, I don't know, I haven't received the operative report. I've never seen this patient, by the way. I've never seen this patient yet. I'm going to see her. I'll tell you why. Um, but here, her calcium goes to 7, and she can only, she can only develop a PTH of 18? This is subclinical hypoparathyroidism. She's stressed and cannot compensate, and she becomes symptomatically hypocalcemic. So she is still symptomatic. She's on a lot of active, well, she not, was not on active vitamin D. Her D levels were normal, and 125 was normal too. She's on a lot of calcium. Her blood calcium is now 9.3. PTH is still 18, and she's really unhappy. As she says, my muscles are twitching, but they're not twitching. Um, she thinks they're twitching, but they're not overtly twitching. This is very typical, very typical in people who are symptomatically hypopara. They can be symptomatic and not have frank hypocalcemia. And I put her on active, um, I put her on calcitriol. But what else do you think I'm thinking about with this lady? Natparatyroid. Yeah. Not natpara, but teriparatide. Yeah. Maybe one dose of demosumab. This is the first dose of One dose. One dose. And she's now four, four months, five months. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. I want to start her on teriparatide because I, she certainly meets the um, osteoporosis guidelines. T square minus 3.4. Um, she's had a fracture. And so she's perfect candidate for teriparatide. And I'm going to give her PTH, or an equivalent. And I'm going to take care of her relative hypopara. So I think this is a really neat idea. Don't you think? Unless you have a better idea. I think this is a good idea. I'm going to do this. Um, I'm going to take care of both her hypopara and her osteoporosis by using uh, teriparatide. Anyway, this is um, a very instructive case for me and I hope for you too. Okay, pseudohypoparathyroidism, and we're not going to talk too much about it. This is a very un abnormal, unusual disorder. The NIH has done beautiful work in elucidating the G protein abnormality um, in the uh, transaction systems, both not just PTH, but many other hormone systems. Um, these are people who are short in stature. They have um, 
they have uh, foreshortened uh, fourth and fifth metacarpals, um, and they have a squ short squat neck. They may or may not be um, slow. There are some very bright people with pseudohypoparathyroidism. Seizures are also very common. Um, the way you can tell whether they have foreshortened fourth and fifth is you just look at your, and if you can take a straight edge, you're good. Okay. If you can't, <laughs> you can't, then you may have a problem. But you should be able to connect your last tuckle. There are people who can't do it, but that doesn't mean that you have pseudohypoparathyroidism. Um, but um, it's, um, it is clearly the metacarpal is foreshortened, you can see here. And you, cre you couldn't possibly draw a straight edge this way. So that's just them. And these are four sisters, believe it or not, all of whom had pseudohypoparathyroidism. And this is the foreshortened knuckles. Uh, the other causes uh, we won't spend a lot of time on. Uh, other causes of hypocalcemia can occur in these various settings. <coughs> and the symptoms of um, <coughs> hypocalcemia are neuromuscular irritability. Um, they can be a form of paresthesias, Fashtek sign, trousseaus, prolonged QT, and then spasms that can be very, very severe and life-threatening, uh, and seizures can occur. So this is the uh, Schwastek, and uh, Jerry, you, I'm sure you do it all the time, just tap on the facial nerve and you'll get an ipsilateral twitch, um, and that is a sign of neuromuscular irritability. It's not specific. 10% uh, of the normal population, when tapped, will show that little twitch. Um, and I make a joke, and as long as none of you is from Brooklyn, are you from Brooklyn? Uh, not my generation. Okay. You know the joke about people from Brooklyn, one out of seven Americans, this is going to be really bad. <laughs> <laughs> one out of seven Americans, I yeah, will put that up, um, admit to being born in Brooklyn, and the other six don't admit it. <laughs> That's cute. The joke about Brooklyn is that people, there's a certain Brooklyn accent, and it, it kind of has one, of the, one side of the mouth doesn't work. <laughs> it's a, a classic Brooklyn accent. And uh, boy, what people, excuse me, those of you from Brooklyn, I'm sorry, but you might have a Schwastek sign, and it may, and it may, complete, and it may be completely normal. Now, m much more specific is the trousseaus. And the trousseaus is when you blow the blood pressure cuff up a little bit above systolic. Not a lot, a little bit. And you hold it there um, for a, a minute or so, and the patient will develop the carpal spasm. And when that happens, deflate the cuff. Do not keep it on. Please, you've already made your point. And the patient is not going to be happy if you keep uh, the cuff inflated. But this is much more specific for hypo symptomatic hypocalcemia than is the Schwastek sign. There have been a few reports, by the way, of perfectly normal people who will show this uh, Trousseau sign. So it's not 100% specific, but it's pretty good. Cardiac changes, uh, we can see there have been rare cases of congestive heart failure, particularly in the pediatric population. This is the prolonged QT in hypocalcemia. It tends, I think this is seen much more in the acute phase of the hypocalcemia. Somebody who's chronically hypocalcemic, you're not as likely to see a markedly prolonged QT. And as we talked about before, the, um, the signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia are just the opposite of hypercalcemia. So how, how low is the serum calcium? How rapidly does it fall? And how long has it been present? And uh, obviously, individual um, variability is important. So for symptoms of acute hypocalcemia, uh, if there are no symptoms, um, we will give calcium if the corrected calcium is less than 7.5 milligrams per deciliter. We tend to intervene at this point, even more so if somebody has a history of seizures. You might be more proactive. And in somebody who has osteoporosis and a history of compression fractures, the last thing you want is another seizure. So you might be more proactive depending upon the, uh, the history of the patient. We use calcium gluconate. We never use calcium chloride because when calcium chloride extravasates 
outside the blood vessel, it can sclerose the soft tissue. It's very painful and disfiguring. Uh, much less irritability when you use uh, calcium glucate if it were to extravasate, much less. Uh, and um, we use a few amps to take the edge off the hypocalcemia. Do it slowly. Don't do it um, fast. Don't administer any electrolyte rapidly. And you'll have a patient finding uh, good relief. Um, we learn lessons when we're on our house staff. You'll note by what, I, what my life is, I've learned a lot of lessons along the way. I was called by, um, by uh, one of the nurses on the wards to administer calcium in somebody who had well-known hypopara and she had become symptomatic. So I went, you know, I don't know what time in the morning it was, like 3 o'clock in the morning, and I had my amp of calcium gluconate and just gave it to her. And she was a seasoned patient. She looked up, stares at me, points her finger at me, and says, Doctor, don't ever do that again. I learned a big lesson from her. Don't ever shoot in any electrolyte like I did. Do it slowly. Take your time. <laughs> and then um, your calcium will go up a little bit um, um, by one or two milligrams uh, per cent over the next few hours. Um, there is a caveat in your hypocalcemic patients who are overweight. Um, th there is a formula of 15 milligrams per kilogram. If you follow that formula, it, that's based for normal weight people. People who are overweight have um, obviously a big, much bigger fat compartment, and calcium doesn't go into the fat compartment. It's water soluble. It goes into the lean body compartment. So you get a misread if you do it by body weight in someone who's overweight. And if you give 15 milligrams per kilogram, uh, like this example, in a person who's markedly overweight, your, the serum calcium may really go up. And I had that experience once, so be careful. I would adjust downward a little bit by this recipe um, in someone who you want to get the calcium up over an eight-hour period of time, you will do this. Uh, you'll follow this formula. Okay, and we use uh, dextrose. We don't use bicarbonate or phosphate. We, eh, you can monitor the EKG. Eh, I don't know if that's necessary, but if you have a reason to monitor, you might do that. You want to correct the calcium first if acidosis is present um, to um, keep the partition in the ionized form by virtue of the acidosis. Uh, Okay, um, and then in terms of subacute management of hypocalcemia, milk. I, this patient I talked on the phone with well, just the one I presented to you, she said, Doctor, what can I do when I feel like I'm twitching? And I said, take a glass of milk. Can you drink a glass? Yeah, I can drink milk. And I take a glass of skim milk. Skim milk has more calcium than whole milk. And drink it, and that's the, most, that's the fastest way to get relief from hypocalcemia. So drink a glass of milk, and that will take the edge off the hypocalcemia. Chronic hypocalcemia, obviously we're going to talk about hypopara, uh, oral calcium, oral vitamin D. We have lots of different calciums. We tend to favor the carbonate only because they get more calcium in. But in those who have GI intolerance, um, you would go with the citrate. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you use the citrate or the carbonate if you tell your patients to take the calcium supplement with food. You don't need gastric acid to absorb calcium if you take it with food. Everybody says, well, you, you need gastric acid to absorb calcium carbonate. That's not true. That's only true if you're in the fasting state. You need acid. And in that case, citrate is better because citrate doesn't require gastric acid. But protein is acid. And if you take the calcium supplement with a protein-based meal, you don't have to have gastric acid. Okay? And the other thing about taking these calcium preps with food is that you have a 10% increase in absorption efficiency. So lots of reasons why people should take calcium around mealtime, just after meals. And I don't care whether it's the carbonate or the citrate. People, some people with the carbonate have more bloating. They complain of, of uh, constipation. No one has ever shown that it's 
it causes GI dysfunction, but anecdotally that is a problem in some patients. And then in terms of the management, uh, Gaia was saying, and she's right, uh, you have a form of a, of a 25D that we don't in this country anymore, so we don't have this available. We use parent vitamin D, either ergocalciferol or cholecalciferol, in hypopara along with active vitamin D. Um, in Europe, the, um, there's a greater emphasis on using vitamin D than in the U.S. In the U.S., we tend to use more calcium and less vitamin D. I don't know why. Um, it's just a matter of how we are and how Europeans think about it. There's nothing wrong with pushing D. In fact, it has some rationale to give more D and less calcium. But in any event, we tend to use a combination of the parent uh, forms as well as the active forms. And then the nutritional amounts of D, we've talked about 600 to 800. Pharmacological amounts are over 1,000 units per day. So I'm going to stop here because um, Michelle is going to talk to you about hypopara on, on Thursday, I believe. So, no? Not right? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Oh, yeah, that's right, May 2nd. All right. So this is perfect. Yeah. So tomorrow, I'm going to be with you from 9 to 11. We're going to start our discussion on osteoporosis. And then Stavrula Kruseni will give you a talk on the basic molecular links between bone remodeling and glucose homeostasis. Aubrey Stock will talk about metastatic bone disease. Eileen Fenoy on pediatric bone. And then Michelle will talk to you about hypopara. Uh, I will put my name on this uh, list. And then, uh, Gaia, maybe you can make copies so we can distribute this. So we'll all be able to stay in touch with each other. Uh, and believe it or not, I really do want you to stay in touch with me. I, I still get emails, I really do get emails at least once a week from one of you, and it may not have been last year, it may have been 10 years ago. They say, remember me, I had your preceptorship 10 years ago, I can't remember you, but I, I sort of remember you. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, but no, we will distribute this so we can share our emails and um, stay in touch. Sure. I think I misunderstood something you said. So you mentioned that the parathyroid glands are very resistant to radioactive iodine, but rarely it can cause hypoparathyroidism. Is it dose dependent, or is it that some people just express the sodium iodine mm. receptor? No, nope. no, I don't know. It's just a general point. Uh, um, the parathyroid glands don't get affected by iodine. Whether uh, I went 31 therapy, um, certainly not. Now, the Chernobyl experience um, was um, initially, uh, Dr. Robert McConnell, who's our th one of our thyroidologists, was on that blue ribbon panel of Chernobyl, and obviously thyroid cancer became an issue. And Bob thought at one point that there was uh, perhaps, uh, a, a, he was thinking out loud, but it didn't turn out to be the case, whether parathyroid cancer was being seen. But I don't think that's been substantiated. Uh, I don't know. So for some reason, the parathyroid gland does not pick up iodine. Um, and obviously, tissues are very selective. There are very few tissues besides the gonads and the thyroid gland that pick up iodine. And even though the parathyroids are next to the thyroid, they're not even affected by the proximity you know, it, doesn't, it could be that it isn't being picked up, but it's still getting affected by the energy. But that, that doesn't seem to be the case either. So I don't know. But it's not, it's not, it's very general. It's a general observation. You rarely, rarely see somebody with hypopara who has a history of I-131 and make a case that the, that's caused it. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. What is the mechanism by which adrenal insufficiency causes hypercalcemia? You're going to answer that question. Okay. It has, I don't know. <laughs> I, thought that, I thought that's why I picked you, so you teach me. I think it has to do, I don't know. Uh, I think it has to do, um, nobody knows. But if the glucocorticoids are anti-vitamin D, and they are, we don't know how they're anti-vitamin D, but they affect GI tract absorption of calcium by interfering with vitamin D action in the gut. If that's true, if you have adrenal insufficiency, that 
block is relieved, and you might have uh, an absorptive type of hypercalcemia. That is not substantiated. I don't think anyone has done any clear studies, but it's sort of a simplistic, naive answer to the question. I really don't know, but it, it certainly we've seen it. We've seen it. And I thought maybe you, you can tell me or ask Lynette. Maybe she knows. I love it. We just have seen it once. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen it once too. And it was very severe hypercalcemia. The patient's calcium was 16. And I've never forgotten. Yeah, so every once in a while you see it. And, but the mechanism, I don't know. The patient is not on crisis, dehydrated, so it's independent of that, of dehydration. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's independent of dehydration, but dehydration makes it worse. Yeah. With Cushing's, you can get hypercalciuria. So I don't know if maybe there is just decreased yeah. calcium excretion with adrenal insufficiency. I don't know. But yeah, it's another thought. You certainly can get hypercalciuria with, uh, with Cushing's. Yeah, I don't, uh, it's a very good, th I mean, it, this is an area that we don't really know. Um, what mechanism can account for, it could, it could be something like that. I don't, I don't know. And even on Cushing's, we put them on ketoconazole and they become hypocalcemic. Yeah, 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 that's right. Well, maybe you'll have time to call Lynette and ask her, tell her it came up in the preceptorship and ask her, she knows everything. Lynette knows everything about adrenal disease. Maybe she can teach us about what, what that's about. Okay, very good. Have a good evening, uh, and we'll see you tomorrow morning.